Welcome, welcome to Evening TV and to the My Ransom Notes podcast, the NOAA radio show. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you about parenting and, and the question, a lot of times you hear people say that when they had children, it really opened their eyes to their parents and made them have all this compassion for their parents. All of a sudden they went, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. It was such a hard job. Blah, blah, blah. Right? And I think I've expressed here before that for me, and I think it was a common thing for a lot of us that had emotionally abusive homes and narcissistic parents and self-absorbed parents and immature, emotionally immature parents, that our experience was actually quite the opposite. That our experience was that it was even that much more of a confirmation that something was really, really wrong. Because we had these children and we felt this way about them. If we were lucky, if we were lucky, you know, some of us were were damaged in such a way that we never wanted to have children or we were unable to bond with children or we were too afraid that we wouldn't be able to bond with children so we never had them or or you know a wide variety of things and of course those of us who were raised by narcissistic parents who became narcissists ourselves then that's a whole other ball of wax but um but just for those of us who ended up being on the empath side and the codependent side um there were you know a, not all of us were were that confident about becoming parents and um and you know sadly some of us who were really able to give love and stuff chose not to because we because our pain, our childhoods were so painful that we were afraid that that you know that we thought you know there were a variety of things that we might have thought we might have thought that we're too broken um, we might have thought that childhood is just awful and painful for everybody. Why would you ever do that to somebody? You know, there's a whole bunch of things that you might think. In my case, I was pretty clueless about how unusual my childhood was. I so I didn't know I didn't know how miserable it was. I, I didn't know how bad it was. I didn't know how abused I was, and I really did think that I had a pretty good childhood. And so I didn't know that I. I believed when I became a, when I was becoming a mother that I was going to be able to provide my kids with a really great childhood, and that I was going to that I was going to be a great mom, and that that I was going to be able to. Um, I recognized that there were certain things that my parents didn't do that I wanted to fix. I knew that they you know they never told me they loved me, and they were never physically affectionate, and and our relationship was not that close, not that. You know, not, they couldn't, I always had to, I, I, I wasn't free to just be myself around them. And I wanted to fix all those things with my kids. You know, this is intellectually. But I thought that I could totally fix that. I thought that it was just a, that, that was just, that was just something I could just fix. I could just choose to fix it. A few things happened. And the first, you know, the first was this, this, this epiphany when I had children, and it happened almost immediately, almost from the moment I laid my eyes on my son, my first son, almost immediately I knew no one ever felt this way about me. The way I feel about this person, I know no one ever felt this way about me. And I knew it to my core. I think that there was enough oxytocin and enough chemicals going on in my mom's brain that she had the the birthing chemicals, the bonding chemicals, right around when I was born. Um, to that, that was that that was actually the best time of our relationship. That that was actually the closest we ever were within those first days. But still, it wasn't the same. It wasn't. It wasn't the way that I felt, even because even the way that I handled pregnancy was different. My um, my mom was somewhat detached from her pregnancies. In that, for example, um, I was born on a Friday afternoon, 
but that's because she just induced it because she wanted to get to it was the fourth of july weekend and she wanted to get to the beach for the fourth of july and so she didn't want to have have to deal with going into labor and all that so um when she finished work that friday they just went ahead and induced the labor and, and had me. So it was like that kind of thing is something I just never would have done. And I think that there was a there's a mindset to that. that I wasn't allowed just to be from the very beginning. You know, from the very beginning I had to it was all about what was what she what her what was convenient for her and meeting her needs. And um right right from the very get go. And I, I think that was a really um telling decision to make. It was a decision I never would have made. Never in a million years would I have made that decision. And, um, you know, both of my kids, um, you know, I went, into, I went into labor naturally with both of them. And, um, you know, so, and I had, I had natural, completely natural, unmedicated births with both of them, with a midwife. And, um, you know, it was, that was just a decision that I was, you know, I was really, really into just letting the natural process of that all take place and letting it be really organic. But this also brings me into another question, another thing that that's been, you know, that's that's kind of a tough thing. And that is that, you know, I, I was very deliberate in becoming a mother and becoming, you know, a mother. And I did have a fear, I will have to admit, I did have a fear about having a daughter. And so I... I knew about how to do gender selection, and so I purposefully tried to get boys, and I, and I did get boys. And as I healed and as I got older, I started to realize I would have been okay with a daughter, and it probably would have been a really cool thing. But I was I was a great mom for boys. That was fine. All of it was very deliberate. None of this happened by happenstance. You know, I was. I wanted to become a mother. I want that's part of why I was so susceptible to getting married to this guy was that I I really wanted to have kids. I really wanted I want to get started soon. I wanted to be a young mom. And so from my from the perspective I was looking, he in my not knowing anything about any of the problems that would eventually come up, not even knowing they existed, let alone existed in him. Um, you know, I was looking at him and just thinking he's a, a you know, basic guy's handsome and he's, you know, hardworking and he's crazy about me and he'll, he seemed like a good lion, you know, like a, a, the lion would roar and I could be a lioness and take care of the cubs. That's what it seemed like in my very primal sort of simple way of looking at it. And I was sort of in this lioness's mindset about the time when I met him. I was really looking for someone to be the lion so that I could have babies and I could nest and I could become, I always really wanted to get get domesticated and set down roots and be all about family. That's what I was really, really focused on. And, and so that's, you know, that's what I did. Well, the devastating thing about it is, is that what ended up happening is that not only did that dream not happen? Did that dream of this, you know, of my being this Mother Earth kind of person and my kids having this really great, peaceful, loving childhood that was simple and, and clear of all the things that, that, that mine wasn't, you know, that I, that it, 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 not only was it not that, it was, it turned out to be really, really bad. I mean, it turned out to be all the things that were just every pitfall and every, I mean, and, and the thing about it is, and this is, this is kind of what I want to talk to you about is what it's like when you, you're this kind of a person and you, you really are thoughtful about what you're doing and you've got yourself involved with someone who now you can't save your kids from having the disastrous things happen. So now I can't even have an amicable divorce, you know? Now I can't even co-parent like normal adult people, you know? Now, because of who I am married to, because of who their father is, my kids are doomed, destined to have, and because of who our family was, they are destined to have 
an estranged family, lack of family support, chaos and conflict between their parents. It's just, it's just going to be all around bad and there's nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing I can do about it. I can't, I can't stop all the bad behavior. I can't stop my ex-husband from creating conflict all the time. I can't stop his wife or his fiance from gossiping about me around the kids and creating a bunch of, creating, uh, being so divisive. I can't stop my sister-in-law from talking about me all the time when, you know, I can't stop all this bad behavior from happening. And so now not only am I not going to have, not, not only are my kids not going to have this, this life that I dreamt of, they're not even going to have a decent divorced parent life. Now they're, now they're, now it, it went straight from this, this idyllic thing straight to almost as bad as it can get. And there was nothing I could do about it. And just the horror of that, you know, I want to, I just want to kind of put that out there that, you know, it, you know, and how, you know, how do we deal with that? So, so now, you know, you've, you've got these precious little children. If you, you know, if you were anything like me, I mean, it was, this was deliberate. I got married and I had children and I was, a, I was a stay at home mother and we, we, went into business together so that I could, you know, I was, it was really all about these kids and I moved up around my family so that they could have an extended family. And I assumed, and this is, this is, you know, kind of, you know, there are some, still some question marks that you can't help but have, you know, how is it that I, I didn't have a clue. I did not have a clue until all this happened that this was even possible of happening. Like I, you know, when I moved up to be near my family, I assumed that it was going to be for my kids the same way it was for me with my grandparents and how close we were. I assumed that it was going to be like that. I assumed basic things. I assumed that, you know, at the very least, there would be, you know, just decency and loyalty. And, the, you know, I didn't, I didn't think, you know, nobody hated me. You know, nobody, hate, you know, even if they, my parents didn't, didn't come out and say they loved me, um, I didn't believe that anyone hated me and didn't think anyone had ever hated me. You know, so the, I, the idea that it could turn into what it became just never occurred to me. And it, at the time when all this happened, I kind of lost touch with, with my friends. I've talked about that a few times and have since recently kind of come back in touch with my friends. And in the meantime, they went through divorces. And so, so at the time when all this was breaking up, I, their lives still looked pretty perfect and mine was just in complete chaos. And then when we came back together, um, our lives were more similar. They, we'd all been through divorces. I was patched back up, but they were in very healthy, amicable divorces. You know, the kids were, the kids had weathered it fine. They, there was nothing outrageous that happened and um, no one, you know, none of the bad things that my kids went through in the divorce did these kids have to go through. And if you, if your ex-husband or your ex-wife is this kind of litigious, dramatic, you know, like uh, personality disordered person and you get drawn into this kind of a divorce situation, you are just, you are cast with the same, you're, you're basically considered um, a, a self-centered uh, person who's in conflict, who doesn't, who's not putting the kids first because that's the reality for the kids and it takes two to tango and all these myths that go on and so if your kids end up in, a, if you end up in a conflict situation in a custody, litigious, um, you know, um, unfriendly, aggressive situation, even if you are completely, it's not anything you want. You're, you would, you, you beg your husband or to not do this, to stop it, to not have this kind of conflict. You were, you were willing to settle it all out of court. You never expected to go to court. You never expected to have lawyers. Never expected any of this. It doesn't matter the courts, the public, even your kids 
might think that, you know, they might, because they'll hear all this, you know, they were just pawns, they were just pawns in the thing, that, you know, nobody put them first. Um, and my, my kids, I don't think, I don't think, um, thought that, at least not very long. There were, there were periods, I think, when they were, they were being manipulated, where they might have lost track of how, how it was going, but they were pretty much, they were right in, in, in touch with me, and, and so I don't think that they ever, they ever believed for very long that I was, I was um, sacrificing them to meet my own needs for um, revenge or anything like that. But it was still confusing to them. And, and I, and it, because the other thing is, is that they would, they would still even interpret it as, well, he loves me too, mom. He wants me, he wants me just as much as you do. Right. That's, they would, they would, they would, um, you know, interpret it that way. And, and, and they did a little bit. And so, you know, it's really hard because, you know, you can't really talk about him. You know, it's really, this is a really difficult dance to do because you want your kids to understand that it, I always thought it's better for my kids to understand that they have one parent that does totally have their back that unconditionally loves them and that is here for them no matter what and if that means that they have to also know that their other parent isn't isn't putting them first isn't a good guy and doesn't love them then that's what it means but they don't they aren't open to that and so what you'll end up finding is that you're in, in, in there's only oh, there's only a couple of ways to explain what's happening and the 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 norm is to explain it as you know he said she said takes two to tango um they're you know both parents are flawed both parents made mistakes both parents are you know involved in this thing right and what the kid gets in that case is they get two parents who are emotionally immature and flawed and not putting them first and all that. But you don't get one that's really bad. You don't get one that's a complete sociopath and, and, and doing it deliberately and has no conscience and all that. You don't get that. But you also don't get the parent that loves you and would put you first and has your back and would never sacrifice your needs for their own and all that. You don't get that either. And so that's always the thing that we were up against. If my kids, if my kids wanted to um, preserve their relationship with their dad, then I couldn't be the mom for them that I was. And I always felt like it was so much more important that they know that they have one person in their life, one adult in their life, that love them unconditionally and would always put them first, rather than having to think that their dad was okay, that their dad wasn't a really bad guy, you know? Um, but that was not a conversation I could have. I just had to, I just had to, you know, leave that up to the universe and leave that up to maturity and hoping that it would all come around. But, you know, in the meantime, in the meantime, my kids, suffered with you know they had they had complex post-traumatic stress disorder they had all of these things that you just never imagined when you when I when I decided I was going to become a mother and I was going to devote myself to my kids I I never could have imagined any situation any scenario where this why would my kids end up with post-traumatic stress disorder why would my kids end up traumatized I mean I'm going to love them and take care of them how could they end up traumatized it was just a nightmare to think of that. I never could have possibly thought of it. And to, you know, to, to think back when I was having children that my kids would actually be up against greater odds, odds for, odds against them that were greater than basically anyone that we knew. That they were gonna have, they were gonna struggle more than 
anyone that anyone any any one of our friends, any one of my friends' kids, any anybody that we knew. Um, just I never could, you know. I here I'm like I'm thinking that I'm devoted to them. I'm I'm absolutely 100% into it. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I've got surrounded by friends, and family, and godparents. And I just you know just I thought everything through, and I was. And how it could end up, how it could end up, the way that it did was just really outside of my, outside of what I could have possibly imagined. Um, I believe that had my son not gotten into drugs, not gotten into um, heroin in particular, in order to medicate his, his, uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety and all that stuff that came from that, that we were, we were well on our way to recovery and that, that there was enough stuff that was healing that was coming, you know, that, that, that there was enough stuff that was healing in our relationship and that ultimately they were going to be okay. I mean, my sons were definitely super compassionate and you know super you know very able to give and receive love and you know all of those things and so that was you know that was those were my goals when I had them and 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 so those goals were, were really met you know they were really they were very close to one another they were very close to me uh, but at this point you know it was still quite different from the rest of society you know they didn't feel like mainstream kids and they were they were wounded and also they're they and they didn't fully understand their family because you know I didn't really I didn't really talk about them that much I would answer questions but it was tricky I didn't know I didn't know the right way to you know I figured that I would be there to answer questions and I would not I would not compound lies I would tell the truth, but I had to be careful not to make my kids feel defensive or protective of their father or their other or the rest of their family. And Noah in particular was trauma bonded with him. And so, you know, Noah really, really, really wanted him to love him. And I tried subtly to let to get him to extricate himself from that desire. But I, you know, it was awkward. There are things I did, I did things awkwardly at times, you know. I mean, I tried to explain that his the antisocial personality disorder, that that probably meant that love was not going to be possible for him. And that was not a good conversation to have. I, and I don't know if I did it, if I shouldn't have done it at all. I don't know if I did it at the wrong age. Um, I think he was about 15 or 16 when I said that. And, um... He didn't say anything right away that day, but later when he was upset, he said something to me about it, about my calling his dad a sociopath, my telling him that his dad didn't love him, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, but what else do you do? I mean, that is the truth. And um, I guess the, the, the topic of this bit of this episode is really just to um, talk, it's just basically the the death of that mothering dream that death of that parenting dream and how it can become something else i will say that what came of of all of it was a really extraordinary relationship that i had with my sons we were very very close and and we were very close in a way and the, and 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 they were extraordinary people you know my son had this art and all this stuff and who knows what his younger brother is going to do he's you know right now he's just really trying to struggle struggling to keep his head above water and not be sunken into sadness and feeling hopeless and and he's still confused about what all happened and what it all means and who all the players are and what he should do with it now and you know, he's he's still got all that going on in his head. I know he does. And he, and he misses his brother, his one and only witness to everything that went through it all with him. So the, the real, so the point of this video is that is just the realities of, 
of the death of that original dream and how and retelling the story what's you know what's the story now what's the new story you're going to tell what's your new parenting story your new family story you know what is that going to be and how 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 will you navigate these waters with your kids because like i said you know it went oh it went from in my case it went from having this dream of this great childhood down to ha down to it being you know like the worst of the worst of a bad of a bad situation all that said all that there were still some amazing amazing stories and amazing memories and things that we had that we wouldn't have had if we'd had this predictable perfect life you know there were things that we went through um that were really extraordinary and special and and even even down to down to Noah's drug addiction it was there was even that created some experiences that were pretty extraordinary and pretty awesome like trips that we took and you know i took him to costa rica to do to do iboga we went to the desert to do iboga one time we met um some celebrities and rehab we did like you know, it's all kinds of crazy stuff um so yeah so this is so it's about the realities of your whatever your intentions are as a parent and how they are going to be hijacked if you are in a relationship with a character disordered person and what you're going to do with it and how you're going to rewrite that story okay you guys thanks a lot i will uh, talk with you again real soon please subscribe give me a thumbs up thanks a lot bye, -bye. All right, mom listen yeah, I'm sit listening. down sit down okay at the beginning, in my defenseless state, I was a forefront warrior to keep me safe. Yeah. She nursed me and taught me to love. In all ways, I felt taken care of. Pure love, unconditional, tenacious. She crushed the threats that opposed us. And no fault to, to her own When I have found a struggle And I felt alone But thank God for my mom To help me through But she's got stories of survival and triumph And there really isn't anything in a story That makes me want to give up Now from being an infant to boyhood I'm a man now and it feels good But her love, her love will always stand Now owed to my mother who gave me the capacity for love And the ability for my heart Mom, and then it's just like this letter, it's like, Mom, I believe like I'm more like you than basically any other person I'm related to, and I love you very much. Aww. And yeah, Aww, presentation isn't that, that good, but this one's the real one, and there might be some other good lyrics on this one.